Hello, I'm Bob Wes, and today we're going to wade through part 11 of this 16-part deep dive. We'll be focusing our efforts today on season 12. Season 12 is a doozy. There's a lot of stuff here, so let's not delay. Season 11 ended off with Cass and Sam thinking Dean blew himself up to save the world. The darkness gifts Dean his mom, and the British men of letters toss Cass aside and cap Sam in a leg. I have two upcoming series, one where I sort of profile characters and one where I talk about seasons one at a time, and they'll both will talk about Mary, so I'm not going to go into it much here. Much like Sam in this series, we'll only be talking about her in relation to Dean and Cass. In this season, their first interaction, Cass has been fighting to get back to the bunker and save Sam to fulfill Dean's last wish. Dean runs in, trying to get Mary to put down the gun, not because he's afraid Cass will get shot, because that won't do anything, but rather because Cass could smite the ever-living crap out of her if he thinks she's a threat. Cass's emotions of relief are palpable here. He and Dean share a moment in spite of the new audience. Uh, Mary is confused on who Cass is. Cass is a little confused when Dean just starts introducing who and what he is to some random stranger. Dean's like, surprise, it's my mom, and Cass is like, sort of, yeah, um, okay, weirder shit has happened anyway, I guess. In that awkward moment when Dean realizes he was conceived in that backseat. Mary just witnessing Cass casually come at that driver. Dean is, like, low-key proud, but also, like, trying to keep it cool. Cass takes care to try to reach out to Mary. While Dean is off making calls, Cass gets coffee for the two of them and is trying to offer any sort of words of comfort he can. Cass this season is very focused on protecting Dean's family, setting his priorities in line with Dean's. We see it here as he tries to help and as he applies pressure to try to find Sam, later kill Billy to protect them. Cass and Dean's conversation about his mother is significant in my mind. Dean doesn't usually open up, even in small ways, to people. He doesn't express doubt or ask for advice, even for sort of insignificant things that often. But with Cass, he feels comfortable enough voicing his concerns. Cass, hey. So, here's the thing. It's been kind of weird here with, you know, Mom being back. It's, it's like we don't know how to act around each other. So we just kind of make this small talk and act normal, but it's it's so not normal. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what did, what has she said to you? Well, nothing. I mean, that, that, that's the whole point. Okay, well, what have you said to her? Well, nothing. I, I don't know what to say to her, you know? It's, it's, it's like it's all just too much, and I, I don't want to overwhelm her. Don't make things needlessly complicated as you humans tend to do. I'll call you. Yeah. Right. Cass, of course, is just like, communicate, you idiot. Hey, Cass, what do you got? I think I may have found Sam's location. It's a farm. It appears empty, but it was rented two weeks ago to a woman with an English accent. Did you have a look inside? No. No, it's, it's powerfully warded. Powerfully warded? Okay, see, buddy, that, that, that was your headline right there. Are we still discussing the same thing? Where are you? I'll text you the address. Okay, got it. I'm on my way. Dean begging Cass to save him when he doesn't want Mary going with him. They don't meet up again until they're hot in Lucifer's heels. The thing Sam has to put up with. Dean. Hey, consider switching up from duds there. It's a bit stiff for this town. You can be an agent or something. Yeah, maybe a third tier agent. At least they don't look like a lumberjack. Okay, enough. Guys. While Crowley walks them through the fact Lucifer is now president, Cass and Dean keep looking at each other when the other isn't looking, and I'm here for it. After Sam and Dean are arrested for high treason or whatnot, Cass calls Mary. In her accusations, Cass adamantly insists that Dean told him to go. He was following Dean's orders, though the guilt of that will eat away at him anyway. When he meets back up with her later, she starts to get a sense of just how much he cares for them. I keep telling myself they're fine. They've only been gone... Six weeks, two days, and ten hours. Cass doesn't handle well that he lost them and can't find them. Dean calls for Cass and sets Cass running to grab Mary and even in desperation the British men of letters to try and make sure that they get back safe. 
When they finally meet up, Cass is emotional to see them. This guilt will slowly build in him over the entire season and lead to most of his decisions down the road. The look Dean throws Cass when midnight hits and he knows Billy is coming for them because, of course, going through his head is a goodbye because he isn't going to let Sam die for him. Cass is not having it. This scares the crap out of Dean. He digs down deep into defensive mode, as he does a couple of times in this season. You can see his face on the bridge. He's scared, but also like he knows Cass just saved his mom, but he doesn't know at what cost, so he immediately shuts down and gives Cass the cold shoulder because he has freaked right the fuck out. You talked to Cass yet? No. So what, you're just gonna keep walking past each other in the kitchen not saying a word? Maybe. Look, yes, Cass killed Billy, but he saved us. He saved mom. How long are you gonna stay pissed? I'm not pissed that he cares about us, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. But Billy said there would be cosmic consequences if that deal got broken. You have any idea what that means? No. Neither do I, but I'm pretty sure it ain't jelly beans and cheese strings. My point is, Cass thought he was doing the right thing. Destiel may not be canonically said out loud, but if you're watching the same show I am, it's here. It's right here. This entire episode is gold. You guys know that. I feel bad for Sam, who is an unwilling witness to these two idiots, while he is well aware that they are in love. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll come with you. Both of you? Sure. Yeah, we can help. And make sure you don't do anything else stupid. All right. Guys, you know what? This, this silent treatment thing, it's silly. It's not going to work. Whatever we're walking into, we should, you know, probably have an actual plan. What do you want to know? Oh, he speaks. Uh, enough. Cass, you said when you heard Benjamin, he, he was screaming. It was, um... Look, Benjamin wouldn't call for help lightly, and he wouldn't put himself in harm's way if he could help it. Well, this Benjamin seems like he's pretty cool, you know, like he wouldn't make any half-cocked, knee-jerk choices. Yeah, you know what I like about him is that he's sarcastic, but he's thoughtful and appreciative, too. What is that supposed to mean? Okay, okay, the road, road, don't watch the road. Got it. Anything else, Cass? Benjamin is always very careful. Long ago, he found a powerfully devout vessel in Madrid, and her faith, it... She gave him everything, her trust, her body. Wait, so Benjamin's a woman? Benjamin is an angel. His vessel is a woman, but it, it, it's more than that. She's not just his vessel, she's... She's... his friend. Yeah. Benjamin would never put her in unnecessary danger. Okay, well, if this Benjamin is so careful, then what happened? I don't know. That's what I need to find out. And you're gonna storm in right now. Dean has been angry with Cass up until now. Anger, again, is a secondary emotion covering up his concern, but once he sees Isham talking down to Cass and also the serious nature of what's going on, he immediately 180s and is firmly at his side, where he always ends up. Isham basically might as well not be there in that church. Dean is talking to Cass, asking him, and Cass is immediately telling him what he needs to know, because of course he is. Once they find out Isham's backstory with Lily, Dean immediately runs back to Cass. Cass believes Dean wholly and immediately, which of course sets them both up for a major ass whooping. Are you standing here, you Castillo? You believe that? You survived hell. You were chosen by God. No, look at you. You're just sad. I'm pathetically weak. So now, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna carry you of your human weakness. Same way I cured my own. By cutting it out. Do it. 
You blast me away, you'll blast away every angel in the room. I'll survive. Castiel, on the other hand, he's hurt. He might live, or he might just end up a bloody smear on the wall. Roll the dice. That's what I thought. They help Lily defeat Isham, and Dean immediately tries to make sure she isn't about to skewer Cass. He's dead. Are you done? Revenge is all I've had for over a hundred years. It's what I am. Wrong answer. You're done. The next episode, as soon as it's clear something is wrong, Dean immediately demands Sam doesn't bother Mary or Cass with it. Cass would have killed Sam if Dean died a slow, terrible amnesia death without telling him. But, you know. Then, stuck in the middle with you. Oof. Did you know that Cass's I love you here is only the third time a main character has ever said I love you in Supernatural? Sam said, I love you to Dean when he was crazy in season five, and Dean says, I love you to Mary in his heaven memories, and that's it so far. This episode is also the first time Mary would call Cass, Cass, instead of Castiel. That was Fun Facts with Bob Wes. Anyways, I love this episode. It is a bit of a love letter to Quentin Tarantino, but beyond that, it's got great bones and even better editing. I'll spare the long outpour of appreciation for it now. It plays heavily in some videos I have scheduled, so you'll hear me talk a lot about this episode soon. For now, let's focus on these fuckers. Davy Perez, the writer, has mentioned in interviews that it's directly related to Lily Sunder's Sense of Regrets, which is, as we just discussed, a key Destiel moment. So... Everyone wants to focus on the I love you. Sure, great, I'm not looking into that. After Cass is hurt, when they catch up, Dean checks in with his mom, but immediately heads over to Cass. Hey, wow. You look like hammered crap. Yeah, that sounds about right. Let's see it. Ah. Yeah. All right, okay. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, hey, you know what? I've had worse. Oh, yeah? When? Oh, Dean, something's wrong. I I can't heal myself. I think the, I think the demon's spear was poisoned. I don't. I think I'm dying. No. No, you just need some time, okay? You'll heal up the old-fashioned way. Mom, what the hell did you get us into? Sam. Sammy. It's the note of panic in his voice when he's like, it's all right, and tries to comfort him, but it's really the way he calls for Sam to come help. And then, after Cass begs them to leave and they say no, he and Dean lock eyes, and Cass has such an unrestrained pain at the decision. He believes Dean is right here ready to kill himself and stay to try to fight for him. Every single look from Dean as Cass dies, and after Cass isn't dead, Jesus, this whole episode is wild. After that episode, Cass goes out to try to hunt for Kelly Klein, and Sam and Dean keep fighting the good fight. Episode 15, Dean gets a chance and very sincerely thanks Crowley for saving Cass back in that barn. It having been fairly established by now that Crowley is in love with Dean, I'm pretty sure Crowley saved Cass specifically for Dean. Cass calls as he is about to leave for heaven. Even though he doesn't say anything out of the ordinary, Dean still picks up on it. He can tell something is off, and then Cass drops off the map for a bit. Dean gets progressively more and more worried about Cass over the following days. Well, Cass, I've called you three times now. We come back. We've got a line on Dagon. We need your help. Uh, so, you hear anything from Cass yet? Mm, no. Still in my A. You think he's all right? I don't know. Cass, it's me. I've been trying to get a hold of you for days. I don't know what's going on, but we got a line on Dagon, and we got our asses handed to us, even with the cult. So, we really use the backup. 
Just call me back. So no luck with Cass, huh? Yeah, still AWOL. All right, so let's find him. I've been trying. Sam, his GPS on his phone is turned off, and there's nothing in the system about some weird guy in a trench coat getting arrested or turning up dead. Right. Dean, it's Cass. I mean, this isn't the first time he's dropped off the map, you know? And whatever's happening, he'll be fine. He always is. Yeah. When Cass shows back up, it's the second time Dean throws up a defensive wall of anger, but it lasts much less of a long time, like half an hour long, and he's pretty sincere about it after Cass comes to his room. Sorry, Dean. Um, I just wanted to return this. It's a gift. You keep those. Well, Cash, you can't. With everything that's going on, you can't just go dark like that. We didn't know what happened to you. We were worried that's not okay. Well, I didn't mean to add to your distress. Dean, I just keep failing. Again and again. When you were taken, I searched for months and I couldn't find you. And then Kelly escaped on my watch and I couldn't find her. And I just wanted, I needed to come back here with a win for you. And for myself. You think you're the only one rolling snake eyes here? Me saying we had her. We had Kelly and we lost her. And if you find her again? Sam's working on it. Of course, he's hell-bent on finding something that doesn't mean killing her or her kid. Right. And if he doesn't find something, if you run out of time, could either of you kill an innocent? We will find a better way. You mean we? Yes, dumbass, we. You, me, and Sam, we're just better together. So now that you're back, let's go team free will. Let's get it done. I'd like that. Right. I'd like a beer. Let's go back for a second. First off, Amanda Tapping is a personal hero of mine. Also my first celebrity crush, but that is neither here nor there. She directed this episode and got some great performances out of them. Then Cass admits the guilt he felt for never finding Dean after he was taken. Let's look at this mixtape. You guys know you don't have to sell me on Destiel, obviously. You guys know by this point in this video that you don't have to sell me on the raw power of this season for Destiel. I don't think we have enough information to know what this mixtape means. There are a lot of layers. Giving someone a mixtape has become a sort of TV trope, so it's often used in media. So given that a television writer used a mixtape, it may be significant. But we never saw the making of or the giving. The way the label is written sort of seems to make it look like a tape that Dean had in his own collection. The giving of a mixtape was significant because, as some of you will remember and others will have no idea what I'm talking about, unlike making a CD of a bunch of songs from different tapes, making a cassette tape of a bunch of different songs is a raging pain in the ass. It takes fucking forever to do right, and it's annoying as shit. So making someone a mixtape with them in mind was a really dedicated effort. Now, if this was a cassette that Dean had in his own collection of various music mixes, then he didn't go out of his way to make it special for Cass. Given that it is labeled with his own name and not Cass's, that's what I took out of it. But he did give it to Cass as a gift, which on its own is not insignificant. 
it also is music he enjoyed and clearly wanted Cass to have access to and enjoy. That's another layer. He gave away one of his Led Zeppelin tapes, his favorite band, and given that whether or not he made it for Cass, he spent a long time making it at some point, and it isn't like he doesn't use cassettes anymore in Baby's tape deck, not to mention his parents bonded over Led Zeppelin songs. So I think it means something more complicated than just, ooh, mixtapes, sweethearts, but also does mean something, especially since it's a writer's trope. So yeah, probably significant, but maybe not quite as sweet as we want, but still significant. Okay, three things of note. Number one, after Sam comes up with the idea of draining Nephilim's grace so it's just human, Dean is so excited to go tell Cass they have a solution and then so crestfallen when Cass is gone again. Number two, Dean accepts Cass's apology and wholeheartedly trusts him again with no hesitation. It's Sam who doesn't trust Cass's intention and installs a tracker on his phone. Number three, Cass just grabs the cult, trying to spare Sam and Dean the horror and guilt of having to murder an innocent, because he doesn't want it on their conscience. When they meet up again, Dean is pissed again. Cass is sorry again. Reconciliation. Kelly kidnaps Cass and steals Dean's car. Sam is freaking out, wondering out loud why Cass would possibly do this shit. Contrary to character, though kind of in character for how well he knows Cass, Dean just sort of breaks it down like, he knows exactly why he's doing the shit, and he's annoyed but not pissed. And then Dean and Sam race after them. Big scuffle. Dean thinks Cass is gonna die. Cass heals Dean. Cass takes off again and again. Next episode, Sam and Dean discuss what happened. Dean sets an intention to save Cass from the Nephilim's mind washing. Then, still freaked out a bit, he calls his mom. This is Mary. Leave a message. Mom. Hey, I uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, me and Sam were... Uh... We're heading out on a case with those witch twins, uh, Max and Alicia. Um, I'll text you the info, but uh, I know the Brits have got you running nonstop. So if you can't help out, that'd be great. Um, and even if you can't swing by, can you call me back? Just some stuff going down that's kind of got me spun out. be good to talk to you. After that, they don't meet up until the season finale. Dean. There are three Winchesters there, but all right. And then they prepare themselves for a fight with Lucifer. And we all know that that doesn't end pretty. Cash? Cash! Come on! Cass! No, 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 Fuck me. Here's the thing, guys. This season is the season where it was acknowledged in the writer's room and they decided that they wanted to move forward with it and act on it. This is the season. During the airing of the season, Warner Brothers Studios began conducting market research in regards to Dean's sexuality. The exact parameters were unspecified, as goes with market research, but it was in relation to people's views on his sexuality and in relation to how Dean and Cass's characters were viewed. Market research isn't done in a vacuum. If the showrunner did not specifically want to write these characters together, if the actors weren't going to be willing to play these characters that way, then there is no need to conduct market research. It wouldn't have been done. These cold studies are usually done as a tool to try to convince executive producers that there is enough support to pull the trigger on something and it won't affect the chances of renewal. 
At the time the research was conducted, it was being done to try to figure out if they were allowed to move forward with it in season 13. The answer apparently was no. If they pulled the trigger on Destiel, there would have been a risk that the show's ratings would drop enough that it would not get picked up for season 14. So the executive producer team must have spooked. So here I lay it out for you. Season 12 was very likely specifically written as the setup for Destiel to finally click into place. And the compromise was leaving it as subtext, but knowing the direction that they wanted to take it in at this point, the subtext is as plain as it can be without outright saying it, and from here on, I wish for you to take it as as close to canon as the network will allow. Next week, we'll be looking into the events of Season 13 and all that that entails. In the meantime, I want to thank you guys. I put up a crack video at Matt's request, and I posted a quick video commentary on a whim. I came into this year with no plan and 18 subscribers, two of which were Matt and my mother-in-law. I just passed a thousand of you guys. It boggles my mind that there are a thousand people on this planet who currently care about what I'm babbling on about enough to subscribe to my channel. I always love hearing from you guys. I've got an actual plan now, so a bunch of videos are in the works. I'm looking at Patreon, but for now, just check out my Ko-fi page. Even if you can't donate, I try to put some cool stuff up there. I'm using funds from Kofi right now to save for materials so I can do a couple videos on prop and FX makeup recreations for you guys. As always, you guys can email me at bobbertwess at gmail.com, and I always appreciate it if you can leave a like. And if you haven't already, this is that reminder that you too can be part of the little north of a thousand people who are subscribed to hearing this idiot talk about this show. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.